right. Hey, everything's working. We have a sound and video crew back here figuring everything. Sound crew knew what to expect. <laughs> okay, we will get rolling. Hopefully, we I know we have at least a few more coming in, but I see them out in the parking lot. But we're going to get started. And I'm Tim Rosenberg. I'm the evangelist. That's my job title of the Idaho Conference. And it's kind of an interesting job. I travel the world doing Daniel 11 seminars, either short Adventist versions or 10-day public meeting versions. And we had a meeting cancel in Tucson, a 10-day public meeting, so we're picking it up with uh, other presentations in the area. I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you promised to send your Spirit to lead and guide us in all truth. And Lord, we're claiming that promise for each and every person here tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You know, this is a little warmer than I'm used to right now. Yesterday afternoon, I was mowing my yard, and it snowed on me. This morning, it was 21 degrees when I got up. <laughs> so, <laughs> Idaho. <laughs> Anyway, so as I said, this is a bit warmer than I'm used to, but shade feels good here. The presentation we're giving here this evening is the first time I've done it, this version of it. The topic, many, many times, who knows how many, but I've just reworked it and trying to see what I can develop um, for as much material in as short a period of time as possible, <laughs> okay? Um, I'm going to begin with John 14, 1. Remember, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus was telling people, even though we live in a crazy world, don't be troubled, he's got it, right? Verse 29. He says, and now I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Ever heard seeing is believing? He's telling us that prophecy is one of the purposes of it is so when you see it happening, you can believe. And Daniel eleven twelve are a prophecy for the time of the end. And based on Ellen White's comments on it, when it happens, it will have powerful effects. I believe it's beginning to happen. So let's take a quick look at understanding Daniel chapter 11. There are four viewpoints in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Primary viewpoints, I should say. There are probably many more than that. But there are four primary viewpoints. Number one, Uriah Smith viewpoint. King of the North is Turkey. King of the South is Egypt, as in Napoleonic Egypt. Uh, there's not any known Seventh-day Adventist scholar that will agree with him. Uh, so says John Whitcomb, a pastor that does believe in Uriah Smith's viewpoint, and he wrote the book Jerusalem Caliphate, the Third Jihad. Now, I believe Uriah Smith had really good material for his time, but if you go through time, you should be developing your understanding as things happen. Amen. All right? And he didn't have as much history. And besides, I think he did something that we can all be guilty of. He wanted to see Jesus return, and he tried to compress everything into his time. Pay attention. I could be doing the same thing. All right, because I love Jesus, and I want to see him return. He also made a, an assumption that I believe led him into trouble. He believed the king of the north must have its capital to the north of Jerusalem. That is not in Scripture. That was an assumption. Assumptions can turn around and bite you. Okay. Uh, second viewpoint, the timid one. We won't know until after it happens. I would suggest that this is the most dangerous of them all. Why? Well, if you don't know until after it's happened, you're not going to pay that much attention because you don't know. And if you're not paying attention, you might not know when it does happen. These are the ones who really aren't looking at it at all. Uh, we have a yearly Daniel 11 conference in Berrien Springs in October. It is a wonderful experience. Three of these four viewpoints get together to share what they believe and argue with each other. Oh, we passionately argue with each other. 
this viewpoint doesn't show up, what are they going to say? We don't know. But you should see the different people that are coming year after year. We know each other pretty well. And, you know, uh, you're going to see us giving hugs and stuff to each other, even though we passionately disagree. Why? Because at least we know the other guy's studying. He loves Jesus. He loves the Adventist message. And he's studying this prophecy. That makes him a really good friend. <laughs> and so it's really fun to watch these people hug each other, then argue passionately. I wish all of our meetings could be that like that. And we do it every year. We have for about four or five years now. Uh, the third viewpoint. The traditional or atheism is the king of the South viewpoint. The king of the North is the papacy. By the way, that's what James White taught. And the king of the South would be secularist material out of the French Revolution or communism, Marxist socialism. Um, this one was especially advanced by Hans Larendel and Louis Weir before him. And according to this one, whenever you get to the cross, you have the hermeneutic of the cross, all place names become symbolic after the cross. Nothing is literal. Uriah Smith said everything is literal. These guys say everything is symbolic. Except I ran into a problem with it. I was taught this one, and I believed it for a while, although there were some problems with it, and then the big problem really got to me. The big problem was this. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about Daniel and the fall of Jerusalem. And the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. is the fulfillment of Daniel 9. Tell me, is 70 A.D. before or after the cross? It's after the cross, isn't it? Whoops. They're saying everything after the cross is symbolic, and Jesus said it was literal. And it was literal in history. So I had a problem with that viewpoint. And I and many others kept on studying, and we came to this conclusion. This is the one I'm going to be presenting here today. Uh, the king of the north is papal-led Christianity, agrees with the traditional viewpoint. It also agrees with uh, James White. The king of the south is Islam. And here's an interesting point. If you go back to the 1840s and 1850s Adventist charts, you're going to find three woes there being Islamic on those charts. They don't have Daniel 11 on that part, but they have the other. Now, there is a growing number of Seventh-day Adventist scholars, especially the younger ones, that are going this direction because it matches the text the best of them all. Uh, and those of us that are in this viewpoint are sticklers for what does the text actually say. I am not a Hebrew expert, but I work together with guys like Roy Gain, biblical languages guy at the seminary. Uh, it's kind of fun to watch somebody try and go after my Hebrew when Roy's in the crowd. And I just say, Roy, you want to answer that? And I'll say, they don't want to say anything else. <laughs> He's good at what he does. <laughs> And uh, uh, there's also some other archaeolog Adventist archaeologists and many others that have come to this viewpoint, some of which we can't use their names because they're in positions where <clears throat> it's kind of deadly to be known what you believe. This is a risky topic in parts of the world. Um, now, which one is the endorsed viewpoint in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? None of them. There are quite a few theologians that think that one is because it's theirs. But there is no endorsed view. I know that. I spent a full day defending what I teach at the BRI at the General Conference office a couple of years back. And uh, they do not have an endorsed viewpoint. Seen the picture before? Is it an old lady or a young lady? How many see an old lady? How many see a young lady? How many see both ladies? <laughs> this is how we can look at the same text and argue and argue and argue. We're looking at the same material and we look at it differently. There's an older view and a younger view. Some of us look at the Old Testament, Daniel, and we see Islam. Some of us look at it from the angle of Revelation 11 instead of Daniel 11, and they see a younger viewpoint, which is atheistic secularism. 
Which ones are in the text? Both of them. And what I'm going to do this together is to show how the third and fourth viewpoint actually should be working in harmony. And the second, um, the fourth viewpoint, Islam, it is both literal and a globalized religious application. And that's because Jesus said it was both in Matthew 24. He applied it locally to the fall of Jerusalem, then he applied it globally to all his people of faith. And he was specifically on Daniel when he did that. So what we're looking at is three conflicts, just like three woes, Arab Islam and the Crusades, Ottoman Islam and the time of the end. And the question is, who are the time of the end allies of the king of the north and the king of the south, the papacy and what I believe to be the south Islam? Revelation 13, the United States, right? Becomes the ally or enforcer for the papacy. We've said that for a long time, right? Well, Revelation 11 is the one that becomes the ally of the king of the south. And that's atheistic secularism, communism, etc., coming out of the French Revolution. Uh, you have the French Revolution, then you have Marxist socialism, and it develops into the radical left today all over the world. And God's people always get caught in the middle. And folks, I may say something that bothers you a little bit politically because I will not dodge. And if I'm bothering you about going after the left for a little bit, don't worry, I'll go after the right too. It's called equal opportunity offending. Okay? Because one of them goes with the king of the north and the other with the king of the south. Which one do you actually want to follow? So don't expect me to cozy up to either one of them, okay? Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus saves. All right. So communism, you have the French Revolution. Karl Marx turns it into Marxist socialism and it explodes. It comes down in the 1990 and then it explodes back all over the world along with radical Islam. They end up working together. So which one do you see? I'm going to say both of them. Now, I'm going to cut a lot of corners. Uh, in this, you can get a lot more material that every once in a while one of these will show up, but basically islamandchristianity.org, and you can find all kinds of stuff either in video or resource format. This is something you should know fairly well. Daniel 2 and 7, we use it all the time in evangelistic meetings and all the rest, right? Did you know if you know who these are, you know who the king of the north is all the way through? Because every one of these follows Jeremiah 1's pattern. The king of the north would attack Israel from the north. It's not where his capital is. It's the direction of attack. Now take a look. Babylon. Its capital's east. But that's a desert in between. So he goes up and drops down on Jerusalem from the north. And that's exactly why Jeremiah calls him the kingdom of the north that comes from the north. And since that's desert and that's water... Israel will be invaded by land armies either from the north or the south. Now you know why there's a king of the north and a king of the south. It's that simple. All right? Then, Medo-Persia comes in. And they come in the same way. And Jeremiah calls them the assembly of great nations from the north. Then the Greeks come in from the north. Alexander the Great. The Greek Empire splits four ways. And... Uh, Daniel only cares about two of them in Daniel 11, the north and the south. By the way, I just skipped a whole bunch of material in Daniel 11. You have a verse-by-verse -verse outline that gives you the detail if you want to look up the history in more detail. Left-hand column is the verse, right-hand column is how it was fulfilled in history in a brief flow. So we're just not going to cover it all. I've already given you that. Uh, so we have the Seleucid North, Ptolemy South, and guess where Jerusalem gets caught? The place of Jerusalem gets caught, so do God's people get caught in the middle. Right? And Daniel was specifically asking about Jerusalem and the people. Oh, can you see what's going to happen when Jesus' followers go worldwide? The people will become globalized and the place will still be localized. It's interesting. The text matters. Then the Roman Empire comes in from the north. And we get to the time of Jesus. And, oh, I wish I had time to really go into gospel presentation and all the rest. But get this. Daniel 11, verse 22, is Jesus. Anybody remember how many verses there are in Daniel 11? 45. 22 would be about where? Right in the middle. 
God's people get caught in the middle. Jesus dies for his people in the middle. He knows what it's like in the middle. At the end of it, he rescues his people caught in the middle. It's really about Jesus. And this is a chiasm, and Jesus' death is the point of it in verse 22. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. Now, then the Roman Empire divides. It splits ten ways, according to Daniel 2 and 7 and 8. But guess what? He only cares about two again in Daniel 11, north and south. And so we have papal-led Christianity north, Islam south. Islam comes up from the south, Christianity and the Crusades strikes back. Whoops. Boy, that jumped a whole bunch of slides. And all of a sudden, God's people all over the world get caught in the middle, but so does Jerusalem. Question, what city were they fighting over in the Crusades? Jerusalem. What city are they still fighting over? Are you going to tell me that it, the place no longer fits? It still fits. But God's people get caught in the middle. Watch. The day of worship. Seventh-day Sabbath, right? You ever heard that the Sabbath could be a sign of which side you're on? It already is. Watch this. The king of the north didn't want to be called Israelite or Jewish, so he changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. King of the South did not want to be called Israelite or Jewish, change the day of worship from Sabbath to... Where did God's people just get caught? Daniel 11 is a masterful presentation of how God's people are caught in the middle. You follow Sunday, you're following a human tradition. You follow Friday, you're following a human tradition. You follow Sabbath, you're following God's word. It is a sign of which side you're on, and it has been. And what have both the king of the north and the king of the south done, the Sabbath keepers, for the last 1,500, 1,800 years? Killed them. Made their life miserable. God's people have always been on the receiving end of Satan's attacks. But at the end, Jesus will rescue his people, caught in the middle. Now, Dan Daniel eleven twenty nine definitely supports the same as Revelation three, Revelation's three woes. There are three conflicts. Conflicts. It says, at the appointed time, he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. There's the Crusades, the first one. The appointed time, the Ottoman conflict, and the latter one, the time of the end. So we have verses 25 to 28, the Crusades, 29 to 39, the Ottomans, and the time of the end, verses 40 to 45. Three conflicts. So a simple question comes up. People ask me, hey, Tim, does, is the God of the Muslims and the God of the Christians the same God? <laughs> Be careful with that one. If you answer that with a yes or a no, I can prove you wrong. Either one you give me, I, I can get you. And so when somebody asks me that question, I'm looking at them, I'm wondering, I wonder where they're coming from. Because this is a gotcha question. Here's a way to avoid it. You just smile and say, you know, Jesus said they're true followers. His true followers would love their enemies and do good to those who persecuted them. Quick question. Was it the crusaders or the jihadists during the crusades that loved their enemies and did good to the other side? Neither. So here's your answer. There are many Christians and many Muslims who are worshiping the same false god of force, fear, and anger. Do it our way or else. And there are some Christians and some Muslims who have found or are in search of the same true God of love, truth, peace, and forgiveness. And in Daniel 11, it tells us there's a remnant out of both the north and the south that will come together to serve Jesus in the Bible. And I'm not talking Chrislam, I'm talking following Jesus in the Bible. Um, some definitions. You know what a papacy is, right? The Pope. It's ruled by a Pope who claims both global, political, and religious power. Church and state union. A caliph, a caliphate, is ruled by a caliph who claims global and political and religious power. Church and state, or mosque and state. Do you notice they both claim they're going to control the world? Would you note that there would not be room on the same planet for both of these guys, that they both want to control the world? Every time we have a caliphate, we end up having a holy war. Always have, and it's still true today. Uh, Islamists are the radicals who want to bring about a global caliphate, and they want to set up its capital in the city of Al-Quds, otherwise known as Jerusalem. But the media will talk about Al-Quds, and they will rarely tell you that Al-Quds is Jerusalem. 
because all of a sudden the general population would be a little more aware of what's going on in the world. And remember, the more radical left you are, the more you side with radical Islam. And the media tends to lean a little left in most of the media, and they're going to be covering for it. Um, so the radical Islamists include the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Islamic State, Erdogan of Turkey, and Iran and others. And yes, Erdogan of Turkey wants to establish the caliphate. He wants to be the caliph. The moderates are those opposed to a caliphate by force, and the leading ones of those have joined the Abrahamic Accords and of siding with Israel against the radicals, the Islamists. So again, you can check up on part two and five of the videos there on our website. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a look at what's going on. I'm going to skip over the Crusades. I'm going to focus here on two and three for a moment. Daniel 11, 29 to 30. The Reformation and the Islamic Ottoman Empire are described here. And it says, at the appointed time, he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. So the king of the north and the king of the south had a previous fight before 29. And now he's going to return and go there, but it's not going to be like the first and the last. Why? Didn't say yet. But I can tell you this. During the Crusades and in the third round, the papacy gets Jerusalem for a while. The second one, they don't. It, they don't get there. So why don't they get there? The next verse. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. All right. So here's what's happening. There is the island of Cyprus. And the Turks decided that they wanted it in 1571. Well, earlier than that, but they, in 1571 they get it. They're going after it, and the Pope puts together a fleet of 300 ships called the Holy League. And the Holy League is to stop the Ottoman Turks. But the Turks get their fleet over here first, drop off 15,000 uh, soldiers, and the fleet heads west, and the two fleets meet right in here in the Battle of Lepanto. And in a few hours, 50 to 100,000 men were killed. Uh, those two fleets just slammed together, and mayhem broke loose. And the Muslim fleet was decimated. The Christian fleet, victorious, was so badly damaged that it turned around and went back. Question. It said they'd be stopped by ships from Cyprus. That's exactly where they came from. They didn't get there. Their goal was to take Cyprus and then go to Jerusalem. It didn't happen. Here's a picture that they put out. The Pope had this painted on the Vatican walls. Obviously, the uh, Turks were on the right. They lost. But it said he would return, return home against, in anger against the covenant, against God's covenant-keeping people. Look at the painting that is put up. Instead of the conquering of Cyprus and Jerusalem like the Pope wanted a picture of, here's the painting that's put up the next year. They returned home. They double-crossed the Huguenot Christians in Paris and in France. And the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre when over 70,000 people were killed in less than a week. And so they paint, put this painting up in place of conquering Cyprus because the text said he's going to head back towards the Muslim side, the king of the south. He's going to get stopped by ships from Cyprus. He's going to return home in a rage against the covenant. And that's exactly what history says happens. Daniel 11 is amazing when you look at this. Oh, one side note. Both the Muslim and the Christian military, the navies, sailing into the Battle of Lepanto, believed they were fighting the battle of Daniel 11, 29, and 30. Where did we lose all that stuff? Took an archaeologist friend of mine to dig that up. But uh, let's go to the time of the end, because this is what people really want to know. 
At the time of the end, the king of the south, that would be Islam, shall attack him, the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. Quick question. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, that's western Jordan. Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, and ancient Ethiopia included Sudan and Somalia. Are those atheistic secular areas or are they Muslim areas? They're Muslim areas. Isn't this interesting? Daniel 11, when the king of the south goes down, names Muslim areas. I mean, here's, here's another point. Every place name in the book of Daniel outside of this one is acknowledged to be literal. This one, some people want to make symbolic. Why would Daniel change his methods for these verses and use John's methods from Revelation? And if it fits literally, you should take it literally. And it fits very well literally. But remember, it has a globalized relig religious application as well. Now, these Time of the End allies, uh, you can look at these uh, videos on our website, the U.S. in Prophecy, and you can't look at that one for another week or two or three. It'll be up there soon. I recorded it this last week. Now, we mentioned this already, Revelation 13, ally of the King of the North. The United States? Who's going to enforce religious laws, the political left or the political right? More likely the political right. And the political right right now, uh, there are prophets, Catholic and Protestant prophets, that are claiming they're getting visions from God that Trump or somebody like him would be taking power very quickly to bring make this a Christian nation. Just remember, Dan Revelation 13 says signs, wonders, and miracles to lead people into deception. Uh, I spend a lot of time outside of Adventist websites, paying attention to what other people are talking about. And it's out there. Uh, but you have the, the Dan uh, Revelation 11 as well. Brian Williams, back in December, finished, retired from television, and he said, America in 2021 is unrecognizable to somebody who grew up earlier. So quick question. Is, in the United States, are you gaining or losing freedoms? Everybody around the world knows you're losing them. Oh, in Re uh, Revelation 13, it starts out with lamb-like horns and then turns like a dragon. We're making the turn in this country. We're making the turn. And... Uh, it doesn't take a prophecy guy to notice it. So, Revelation 11, radical Islam and the radical left. Now, let's look at here. What brought down communism in 1990? Reagan and John Paul. This is Time Magazine, 1992, after it happened. This is one of the great secret alliances of all time. Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the communist empire. Step by reluctant step, the Soviets and communist government of Poland bowed to the moral, economic, and political pressure imposed by the Pope and their president. Uh, so they both backed the Solidarity Movement. Ronald Reagan pushed an arms race with the Soviet Union. He started talking about Star Wars, etc., cetera, uh, space weaponization. Interesting on that one. He also armed the Mujahideen, the freedom fighters in Afghanistan, because the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And he was hoping to turn it into a Soviet Vietnam, which it did. They got battered and bruised. Uh, they've already lost as many men in Ukraine as they lost in a decade in Afghanistan. So, Ronald Reagan armed those guys, and under the combined assault of radical Islam, 
the United States and the papacy, oh, the United States and the right, right-leaning party in the United States, Ronald Reagan, and the papacy brought down communism, the left. Interestingly, radical Islam sided with them at the moment. <laughs> but there's a classic statement in the Middle East. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And who was one of those Mujahideen that was trained by the United States and armed? A guy by the name of Osama bin Laden, who instantly turned on the United States as soon as the Soviet Union was out. 2011, our first book came out, and we had some expectations. Because looking at events, whenever the king of the south had a caliphate, the pope would call for war. And that had not happened after 9-11. And so I did not believe we were in the third conflict yet. I thought we were in a warm-up phase for it. And I said, there's a time coming when radical Islam will anger the Pope. The Pope will call for war against radical Islam. The United States and its military would be the enforcers for the papacy. Radical Islam would be overthrown. Moderate Islam would follow papal-led Christianity, and some Muslims would follow Jesus in the Bible. Those were the 2011 expectations. In 2014, in sequence, they began to happen. That's why the revised book came out. Because we couldn't talk about them in the future, we now had to talk about them already in progress. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the self-proclaimed leader of the Islamic State stretching across Iraq and Syria, has vowed to lead the conquest of Rome as he called on Muslims to immigrate to his new land to fight under its banner around the globe. How? So this was on the first day of the Islamic State when they declared a caliphate. And he was the caliph. I didn't know it was going to be so plain that their target would be Rome. And the statement is, they're going to go after Rome and they're going to conquer the world. Well, the Pope wants the world to follow him. Can you see why there's not room for both of these guys on the same planet? The question now is, now that you have a functioning caliphate for the first time since the Turks, how long would it take for the Pope to call for military action? And you may have missed it, but it only took five and a half weeks. August 7th. Pope Francis appealed to world leaders on Thursday to help end the crisis in northern Iraq after a sweeping advance by radical Islamic State militants forced thousands of residents of Iraq's biggest Christian town to flee their homes. His Holiness addresses an urgent appeal to the international community to take action to end the humanitarian tragedy now underway. He's calling for action, and he meant military action. He sent out a whole bunch of ambassadors within the next week to explain that's what he wanted. The very next day, Obama said America is coming to help. Within 36 hours of the papal call to action, the United States struck the Islamic State for the very first time. Pope says sick him, and the U.S. bites within 36 hours. That should put you in the third conflict that is supposed to be like a whirlwind. How long will this third time of the end conflict be? I don't know. That one didn't say it was short, it took centuries. That one didn't say it was short, it took centuries. It says this one is like a whirlwind or short. I don't know how long it'll take, but it won't take centuries based on the wording of the text. Then, Jihadi John, the guy that cut people's heads off for YouTube videos, people like Daniel Pearl and others. Uh, he calls Obama the dog of Rome. Why would the uh, United States and Obama be the dog of Rome? The Pope said sick him and the U.S. bit. Very simple from a radical Muslim viewpoint. And from that time on, the United States has been known as the dog of Rome. They're also called crusaders. Who sends out crusaders? The Pope did. Huh. In the midst of all this, Huffington Post writes this article, Pope Francis wants to be the president of the world. You see, he went to the United Nations, also spoke at the joint session of Congress. 
But at the UN, Obama was there, Putin was there, the Pope was there. Who got the most coverage? The Pope. Why? Hey, during the time of the Crusades, there was a radical form of Islam, violent form of Islam, and the world followed the papacy, Christian world. During the time of the Ottomans, there's a violent form of Islam, and the Christian world follows the papacy. At the time of the end, there's once again a violent form of Islam, and the world turns to the papacy. Every time you have a violent form of Islam, the papacy climbs in power, all three times. Revelation 13, 3, it says, and all the world follows the beast. You ever wondered why? Same reason the first two times. It's there in the text in Daniel 11. Abu, El Abu Baker al-Baghdadi was killed back in 2019. Does that mean he was uh, the end? No. They put a new one in, Kar Karashi. He was killed in 2022. They put another one in. Now, I would say that I'm not sure if the Islamic State is the final caliphate because during the Crusades we had a whole series of Arab caliphates during that section and then Ottoman caliphate and then time of the end caliphate. So there, we could have several of them because we have other players, Iran and others, all who want to do it. And they're all vying for who gets the title. The worst case scenario is scenario is what if they decide to unite then you got real trouble and they're starting to in some ways Erdogan wants to do it uh, Iran wants to establish the caliphate here's an interesting picture from Iran the ships they're all flying American or Israeli flags they're sinking anybody know where that is Temple Mount, Dome of the Rock. I've been in there. If looks could kill. Infidel, they don't like infidels being in there. But anyway. <laughs> uh, look at the water. Is it water? A picture is worth a thousand words. This illustrates their theology. The uh, Muslim, the Iranian special forces that have been attacking the ships and fighting outside of the confines of Iran are called the Al-Quds Brigade. Why should that be important? It's Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Brigade, because they feel that someday their belief is that they will establish the caliphate and they need special forces trained to take Jerusalem. And so this is all about that. And what's the focal point? Jerusalem. And how do you get there? That's a Palestinian headscarf. You support the Palestinians. Now, the radical left supports Palestinians. The radical Muslims supports Palestinians. The moderate left and the moderate Muslims do not. It's really interesting. The Palestinians are Sunni and the Iranians are Shiite, but they're agreeing on Jerusalem and working together for Jerusalem. Al Quds. Suleimani was killed in January of 2020. And on January 7, war between the United States and Iran broke out. This, you may not remember it, but it did, almost. This was just a, the Drudge Report is a news conglomerate, and they have headlines from all over the world, and you click on it, and it goes through the story. This was what it looked like on the night of January 7, 2020. It had, it, the top of the page read, it's war between Iran and the United States. At that very moment, missiles were raining down on, on U.S. bases from Iran. The number two man, the commander of the Al-Quds Brigade, Soleimani, had been killed. That guy. And they were now attacking. A guy by the name of President Donald Trump had said, if you kill one an American, I will, I will hit you with 58 missiles, one for each hostage in the Jimmy Carter years, and they will include military 
cultural, and religious targets. Does anybody recognize what that would mean? You have just gone from Geneva rules of war to holy war rules. Trump was saying, you kill an American, forget Geneva, forget NATO rules of engagement. We're coming after your religious and cultural sites. If one American died, that would have happened. And so with missiles raining down on those U.S. bases, some news media guys said, it's war, except no Americans died. Fifty to a hundred Americans had concussions that night from being underground when bombs blew up over their heads. But they all survived, and Trump held fire. That's how close we came once already. But did the radical Muslims want to back off? Here just a few days later, I'll ask, ask a preacher. This is up on the Temple Mount. Jerusalem will soon be capital of a global caliphate. Siam can be seen telling the enthusiastic crowd that three prophecies would soon be fulfilled, that the rightly guided caliphate will be established, that Jerusalem will be liberated and established as its capital, and that Islam would achieve world domination. They were still focusing on it, still going that direction. Then COVID-19 hit. Remember that? Uh, it's interesting. I flew the day. Uh, the only place where everybody's supposed to be wearing a mask is in mass transit. Airports. And you know, there's probably about 5% of the people who are ignoring it in the airports today. And in the airplanes, they were wearing them pretty well. But... Uh, there are people who are starting to go, no, not going to do this anymore, even in airports. But what about the threat of radical Islamists? Did it disappear? It did in the media, but it didn't in real life. Uh, and Biden won the election, and radical Islam is emboldened. Anytime you have a left-leaning administration, Islam is emboldened. A right-leaning administration attacks radical Islam. It's just, go back and check it in your history. It's the way it works. Senator Lindsey Graham is warning that Israel may have to launch an attack because as soon as Biden came in the office, he starts to work out a deal with Iran again instead of totally stop their program of terrorism and nuclear weapons development. And Israel has said, we will not allow them to do it. You see, Israel's serious about that. Libya was developing nuclear technology and a few airplanes flew over and their technology was gone. And everybody figured Israel did it, but Israel said no comment. Syria was developing nuclear technology and some airplanes flew over and their technology was gone and uh, everybody figured Israel did it and Israel said no comment. Now they're saying either somebody else stops Iran or we will. And they're practicing for it right now. And if they hit Iran, they expect to be hit by hundreds, if not thousands of missiles within the next 24 hours of their attack. And they're so serious about it that even knowing they're going to be hit that hard, they're still willing to do it because one nuclear armed missile takes them out. And what did Iran say? They're going to take out Israel. They're going to wipe them off the face of the map. So this is a very desperate thing there. The thing of it is, moderate Muslim nations are now siding with Israel. Nigeria, 2021. Normally, two to 3,000 Christians are murdered every year by Muslims in Nigeria. I've been up in northern Nigeria. It's deadly serious up there. Uh, they took us in and out in hiding. Um, but in the first 200 days in 2021, already 3,400 were killed. And you probably weren't hearing about it because the media doesn't care about black African Christians. They just don't. If Christians were killing that many Muslims, you'd be hear all about it, but not the other way around. And uh, there was one terrorist attack in Nigeria a couple years back in 1995 that killed about 2,000 people. Do you remember the uh, French Charlie Hebdo incident when they came in and killed 
17 people in a satire magazine for running a cartoon, and then a gunfight in the Jewish deli, about 17 people died. It was within a week of the 2,000 people killed in Nigeria. But there were no pictures and no videos, and they were just African Christians that were killed. That's almost ignoring a 9-11 style event. If the BBC hadn't covered it, maybe nobody would have known. Then, August of 2021, the Taliban take over Afghanistan. Um, take a look at this title. The Taliban's 20-year victorious alliance with China against the U.S. and the Uyghurs. Uyghurs. Oh, radical Islam and China? Marxist socialists, the radical left, working together? Oh yeah, it's been happening all over the place. The allies of the king of the south, radical left. And so uh, China and the radical Muslims empowered and it gave Putin an idea that he could get away with more attacks than he's done in the past. Netanyahu says that Hamas will pay a heavy price for rocket fire, 11 day conflict in May of 2021, a shooting match between Palestinians and Israel with missiles and airstrikes. Radical Muslims and radical left, including in the US Congress, supported the Palestinians. The moderate left and the moderate Muslims supported Israel. In Daniel 11, Radical Islam, Egypt, and many countries go down. Libya and Ethiopia, the moderates, follow the king of the north, and some follow Jesus in the Bible. The split between radical Islam and radical left, moderate Islam, moderate left, is consistent all the way through the spectrum. It follows the same pattern. So they both, radical left and radical Islam, dislike Israel. They both hate capitalism. They both hate papal-led traditional Christianity. They both hate American exceptionalism. They both hate conservative politicians. Uh, when Soleimani was killed, the radical left and radical Islam were angry as could be about killing Soleimani. The moderate Muslims and the moderate left were quietly happy. Both of them like social justice. Islamophobia, homophobia, words that get thrown a lot, around a lot by social justice warriors, right? They're both in it together. Have you noticed the glaring exception? What do m radical Muslims do to homosexuals? They kill them. Have you noticed how silent the political left is about that? Who points it out? The right. Now, folks, here's a lesson that you need to remember from tonight. If you want to know who somebody's allies are, who do they not point out their problems of? And the radical left doesn't point out the problems of radical Islam. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. They both want to take down traditional Christianity and the United States. That's their targets. And what? Revelation 13? The papacy and the United States work together, so no wonder those are allies. Karl Marx, he wanted to take out Christianity from the very beginning. So does radical Islam. And why do Adventists argue about which one is the king of the South when they're working together? It's time they come together on this. Oh, but the radical left excuses radical Islam because... It's called, uh, oh, I just went blank on it. Intersectionality is what they call it. And based on intersectionality, the more oppressed you've been, based on how the political left calls oppressed, the more your truth matters and the less anybody else's truth matters. And since the radical Muslims have been oppressed, then their truth matters, and we've got to give them a pass on killing homosexuals. Oh, I can't resist this one. Uh, by the way, killing homosexuals is just downright wrong. Jesus would not have done that. Okay? 
Which group did Jesus give us permission to hate? None of them. You're supposed to love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you, right? So you can't join the North or the South. But Disney's going after Florida, right? Do you know what points out the great hypocrisy of Disney? They're developing all kinds of deals with the radical Muslim world and they don't say a thing about homosexuals there. Huh? It just shows their hypocrisy. Because they're covering for each other. And the big one is, they both believe Jesus is just a good man, but not God. And the Bible is just a book. It's not an authority. That's what they're both after. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Whenever the uh, radical left or radical Islam gain control of a country, what happens to the Christians? They're killed. Right now, the number one and number two, which is not unusual, it's been this way for a long time, it just sometimes flips on who's number one. Right now, the number one worst country to be a Christian in, anybody have a guess? Afghanistan. Number two? It w was number one for quite a few years in a row. North Korea. Radical left. It's, ever read Voice of the Martyrs? For years, the two groups that they look at and point out how they're killing Christians, it would be the radical left, communist, socialist governments, and radical Muslim governments. They hate Christianity. Now, here's what I'm looking at. The radical left came down, but as radical Islam expands, the radical left comes back up. It's no longer a bad thing to be a socialist in the United States. Remember, at this time, <laughs> at that time, if you were called a liberal, you could lose a national election. Not a problem anymore. At the, there's a guy by the name of Rush Limbaugh back at this point. What was really funny about him, he said we need to keep a couple of uh, uh, liberals around just in a museum somewhere so later generations would know what liberals were like. He thought liberals were gone. He liked the claim he was almost always right. That he was not right on this one. Because radical left comes roaring back and now you can be a socialist to win an election now. You have a whole group of them in U.S. Congress. And so, and, and it's not just the United States, it's all over the world. This left-right divide is all over the world. It's in the Catholic Church. It's in the Adventist Church. It's everywhere. If you want to know what the shaking is in my belief, you're looking at it. The left-right divide. It's everywhere. And it is shaking the world. And uh, I've heard some conversations in some interesting places in the Adventist Church that are hard to believe of some of the social justice warriors and what they're wanting to do within the church. Um, they're both under time pressure, though. Radical left and radical Islam. How long does the American radical left have to get their agenda through? When, when does the clock probably reach a closing of the door for getting their agenda through? November of this year, midterm elections. They pushed really, really hard because they knew they had a short time, and in so doing, they so angered everybody else that there's going to be a massive backlash. I mean, that's not just my thing. I, I mean, I believe that from the beginning, but it's now the polling all says that's likely what's going to happen. The radical Muslims, they're having a hard time hanging on to the power they have and they know they've got to really ramp up things or they're going to lose. Uh, China is ramping up and it's starting to ring off alarm bells all over the Asia Pacific area and in the United States. Putin is getting old and he might be sick. And so he's got a time pressure. He's got to do whatever he's going to do to make it into the history books. and. 
what did Putin just do to the weakened NATO? He threw it back into unity and power. This is supposed to be like a whirlwind, folks. And it sure looks like it's about to explode like a whirlwind. Everything is there. So I'm looking at a time when the king of the north overthrows radical Islam, radical left. Moderate Islam, moderate left follows the king of the north. And some follow Jesus and the Bible from both. And again, if you lean right, be careful. Because the right will teach you to hate radical Muslims and, and the people leaning left. And Jesus didn't give you permission to hate anybody. As a matter of fact, the king of the north and Revelation 13 become the most dangerous of the two deceptions, left or right. So which is most dangerous? If you grew up in a Christian culture, the king of the north is more dangerous. If you grew up in a Muslim culture, the king of the south is more dangerous. If you lean right, the right is more dangerous. If you lean left, the left is more dangerous for you. With one caveat, the one in power is always dangerous. Left or right. Because they can do something with that power. They can make your life difficult. Now, here's why it's that way. If you lean left, you see the evils of the right, but you overlook your own side's troubles. If you lean right, you see the evils of the left and overlook your own troubles. You know, we call it nose blind in our houses. You can smell the problems in other people's houses, but you become blind to the stench of your own house. Unless you go on a long trip and come back and, ooh, what's that? <laughs> That's the way it is with politics. And I'm not saying you can't be voting or something like that, but I am saying if you lean hard left or hard right, you're going to be in trouble. But if you love both of them, you're going to get caught in the you're going to get caught in the middle. The day of worship gets caught in the middle. Jesus got caught in the middle. Daniel 11 is a prophecy that tells us to have courage to take a stand in the middle loving both sides and hating no one. And here's why. The king of the south will go down, the king of the north will go down, and the only people left standing at the end will be the people who had the courage to stand in the middle in love. That's what makes us so incredibly important right now. It also tells us we are in the time of the end conflict. Verses 44 and 45, But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many, he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. So the king of the north is going to go down after the king of the south goes down. Verse 43, the king of the south is down. 45, the king of the north is down. But this tidings from the east and tidings from the north. Remember Edom, Moab, and Ammon escape? Look at there. Edom, Moab, and Ammon to the east of Jerusalem a part of the Muslim world, Western Jordan. Oh, out of the north, Revelation 18. God calls a remnant out of Babylon, the original king of the north. So out of the north, out of papal-led Christianity, God, God calls a remnant. Out of Islam, God calls a remnant. Why this part of Islam is being used? Edom, Moab, and Ammon are all Abrahamic family relatives. What is God saying? The seed of Abraham are going to come from everywhere. Out of papal-led Christianity, out of the Islamic world as well. Now, take a look at the boundaries of the Davidic kingdom. Edom, Moab, and Ammon were a part of it. When Jesus returns, he restores the Davidic kingdom. That would include Edom, Ammon, and Moab. God has a remnant out of Islam. And... There are some conservatives who get really mad when I say that God's going to save people out of the Muslim world. Really? Praise the Lord. He's also going to save people out of the King of the North. Probably about every other group too. We're not supposed to be hating anybody because in so doing we're hating some potential brother or sister in Christ. And they may never become a brother and sister in Christ if we hate them, but loving them might make the difference. And if God loves them and we hate them, can you see a problem coming on for us? 
Look at Joel 2, 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So right before the coming of Jesus, there's going to be a lot of dream and vision activity. Said so, right? It's part of the outpouring the Holy Spirit. Hmm. All across the Muslim world, by the tens if not hundreds of thousands of Muslims are having dreams and visions. Isa, Jesus, the man in white, the righteous one, shows up and he tells them to trust him as their savior and the Bible as their authority. And if they're trusting Jesus as their savior and the Bible as their authority, does it sound like they're my brother and sister in Christ? They don't call themselves Christian, many of them at least. Why? Because in the Muslim world, to take the name Christian means you're a follower of the Pope and a crusader. However, in the Quran, it says there are true people of the book, the Bible, that are to be respected. And so they say, we're these true people of the book. We're followers of Jesus and the book. We don't follow the Pope. When I do a 10-day seminar and there's a mosque in the area, I start on Friday night. I don't want the Muslims showing up to have a demonstration outside or worse, inside. <laughs> and so I take the brochures that look a lot like this and I show up at noon prayers on Friday with this in hand, introduce myself and said, you got these in the mail. You're probably worrying about if it's an attack against Islam. No, it's not. It's going to be honest about both Islam and Christianity. By the way, you need to know something about me. I am a follower of Isa and the book. I don't eat pork. I don't drink alcohol. I don't worship on the Crusader day of worship. I'm a follower of Isa and the book. And they look at me and say, who are you? I said, I'm sharing the Daniel 11 message. There are three conflicts. The Crusades, the Ottomans, the time of the end. Muslims say we're in the third conflict as well. And I say... Whatever, and in the third conflict, radical Islam is going to go down, and usually they're okay with that, because most of them are moderates here in the U.S. Not all of them. Moderate Islam will follow papal-led Christianity, and some will follow Isa and the book. Whatever happens, don't follow the Pope. I have got taken out to lunch before that way. <laughs> <laughs> Barely got out of one that was a radical mosque when I did that. And about 15 people were killed by somebody in that mosque within two months afterwards. So there are a few radical mosques around here. Well, that was actually in California. So what we know is that the majority of Muslims that become followers of Jesus have had a dream or a vision leading them to do so. Hey, if Daniel 11 is happening, if this prophecy is being fulfilled by God himself, that's supposed to happen just before the coming of Jesus, do you think we might be in the time of the end conflict? I think it's really important to realize that we are already into this one and it's time to get serious about following Jesus. Now, current alliances. Who's siding with Russia? China, North Korea, Iran, Syria. Huh. Radical left and radical Islam. Isn't that interesting? And Russia used to be radical left. And Putin has claims to be a Christian, but still has his ways from the KGB. The secular West, there you have a group of people there looking for international control. Uh, and they want control, but you have papal-led traditional Christianity, and I have Vagano there. Uh, he is a bishop. If they get a pope like him, boy, this thing explodes. Uh, he, he wastes no words on Francis. I mean, he, he's attacking Francis all the time. He sided with Trump against the pope. Uh, so he's a radical right within the, in the Catholic anyway. The papacy is after an international religious control. These are all in conflict with each other. Ever heard this saying, never waste a crisis? 
you have a crisis coming on. You have environmentalism. You had COVID and all the rest of it, not its aftermath. You have Ukraine, which gives you a worsening energy crisis. It was there beforehand, but it's worsening. Food in, in the economy. Oh, do you realize that the Middle East gets over 25% of its food from Ukraine? And all of a sudden, Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, these places are going to become even more volatile than they've been because of this attack of the Ukraine in Ukraine. Uh, it's just like a whole bunch of fuses have been lit. And uh, Daniel 12, 1 through 3, Michael stands up. That's the close of the judgment. There's a time of trouble like there never was. Jesus delivers his people, and you spend eternity with God. In a 10-day seminar, that takes four nights to go over. We discovered it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of stuff I don't have time to get into. So what do you need to do? I would encourage you to compare the videos and resources with the Bible. Get a book or whatever. Share with other people if you find it accurate. Invite me to events. Uh, if you want, we have a couple of brochures. You can ask my wife if you want to have us invited into a church. These describe the seminars that we do. Um, so you could pick that up to share with church uh, leaders. Um, also, if you want to make a donation to our ministry to help us keep going, you can. Uh, it can be done at the back, uh, however you want to do it. If you want to do it differently, you could just drop it off of the book table if you want. Um, here's our deal with the Idaho Conference. I am a unique employee. Very unique. When I accepted the invitation to be the Idaho Conference evangelist, the deal was... I could be their evangelist, but they would get put no money into the budget. No salary, no benefits, no nothing. However, I would be paid the same as all other employees as long as we raised enough money for them to pay me. That's 11 years. And the first month there's not enough money to go around, the ministry's done. But it's been 11 years. <laughs> God's taking care of it. So. If you want to support us, you can. If not, that's fine. It's God's ministry, and we're pretty happy with that. Now, I just want to end with a little bit on Daniel 11 and Ellen White. When I first started this study, uh, I believed that com atheistic communism was the king of the South. I got an email from somebody one day, that uh, Samuel Bakayoki, actually, that said, I think radical Islam and the papacy are just going to come together and thus all the world will follow the beast. And when I got that email, I thought, oh, come on, Sam. I like polar opposites, north and south. And when that thought went through my mind, the Holy Spirit just hit me. Tim, you know that prophecy you've been ignoring? Daniel 11? Go look at it. And when I looked at it, with that thought in my mind, I realized I was reading a description of the Crusades, the Ottomans, and what was beginning to happen now and where it was likely going to go. I, thought, I mean, I knew history, and I thought, how in the world did I have these blinders on and never see this before? Because I was taught something different. And God had to slap me across the face just in a moment, and in a matter of two or three minutes, I had a total flip of paradigm on Daniel 11. And uh, so what did I do? I grabbed Ellen White's writings and looked up Daniel 11. <laughs> she hardly said anything. That took less than half an hour, and I was done. Seven years later, after studying Daniel 11 for seven years in the history and the text and everything, I went back to Ellen White. This time, I saw a lot, but I didn't see it till I knew Daniel 11. Let me show you. Some people say if Ellen White did not explain a future conflict between Islam and Christianity, then Islam has no prophetic importance. Said another way, if it's not in the book Great Controversy, it doesn't matter. Boy, would I totally agree with that. <laughs> uh, I accidentally left my Bible in a hotel room. Can I borrow your Bible for a moment? We're going to let this be... Well, this will be the Bible, all right? Early church. Follow the Bible. Is there authority? Good idea, right? Then the papacy starts putting human traditions over it. I can use my stuff 
would be the bad stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, that was a problem. Then um, along comes Muhammad. He said, oh, the Bible was good, but the Christians have corrupted it. Here's the book of the Quran. Cause any problems? Uh-huh. Somebody else comes along, Joseph Smith. He says, you know, the Bible's good, but the Christians have corrupted it. Here's the Book of Mormon. Every time you put something over Scripture, you end up with really bad trouble. Ellen White comes along. Where, where does it go? She said, a lesser light leading to the greater light. She said, below it. Right before she died, she picks up a Bible, one of her last public presentations. She said, brothers and sisters, I commend unto you this book. She never explains Daniel 11. I am glad. The reason I'm glad, if she would have, Adventists would have taken a shortcut and they would have claimed the last message to, for the time of the end, as on Ellen White says instead of the Bible says. So because she didn't explain it, we have to go with what the Bible says, and I do that all the time with public audience, and it works. But Adventists kind of want to know what Ellen White says, and here's some tantalizing things that she says. Take a look. She does not agree with this statement on the screen at all. The time has come for Daniel to stand in his lot. That phrase, stand in his lot, is from the, is the end of chapter 12, the Daniel 11:12 12 prophecy. The biggest vision in the entire book of Daniel, the one we ignore. And so she's pointing to that one, the one we ignore. The time has come for the light given him to go to the world as never before. If those for whom the Lord has done so much will walk in the light, their knowledge of Christ and the prophecies relating to him will be greatly increased as they near the close of this earth's history. So this part of Daniel is going to have a great increase right before the close of this earth's history. Okay. She wrote it in 1899 which means the great increase is not in the book Great Controversy because that was already written. It's not in the pioneers' writings because that was already written. Where are you going to find this great increase in Daniel's understanding? Try Daniel 11 and 12, the part she's referencing. Doesn't that make sense? Here's one of the few times she mentions Daniel 11. It's fascinating in its context. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. The great changes are soon to make, take place in our world, and the final movements will be... You've heard that all the time, right? This is in reference to Daniel 11. At the time of the end, it will be like a whirlwind. Didn't notice that before I knew Daniel 11 so well. The scene that next passed... Be oh. This is... Volume 9, the first chapter called The Final, the Last Crisis, it starts on page 11. So re can you remember 9-11 okay? I'd like you to go read that chapter and maybe the next one too, chapters 1 and 2. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. She'd seen buildings in New York City rising to the glory of men but not to the glory of God. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe but these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. The greatest fulfillment of that to this date would be September 11, 2001. And that was 9-11, the chapter beginning point. That's why I find it easy to remember. Uh, on 9-11, I was pastoring Ozark Academy Church, Gentry, Arkansas. And I headed for the student union. And they had most of the students in there watching televisions. And as I walked through the door, a senior steps up to me and he jams volume nine of the testimonies, page 11, into my hands. He said, Pastor, are we looking at a fulfillment of this today? I looked at it and said, it kind of looks like it, doesn't it? And uh, he said, but it's volume nine. I said, okay. He said, it starts on page 11. I said, okay. He said, Pastor, that's 9-11. I said, okay. He said, that's today's date. Never forgot it since. 
Academy kid had me that day. <laughs> and the fire engines lined up in the streets and destroyed. They weren't able to operate them. Yeah. It goes on. There are not many even among our educators and statesmen who comprehend the causes that under, underlie the present state of society. Those who hold the reins of government are not able to solve the problems of moral corruption, poverty, pauperism, and increasing crime. They are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. Remember, Trump figured he could right the economy. Then COVID hit him, and then he was out of office. How well are we doing? Didn't work out so well, did it? The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. If she's referencing 9-11, boom, Daniel 11 is about to take place. Those final scenes, the time of the end conflict. Man, that was interesting. Here's another one. I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in utmost confusion, war, bloodshed, privation, want, famine, and pestilence were abroad in the land. As these things surrounded God's people, they began to press together. Suffering, perplexity, privation caused reason to resume its throne. There seemed to be a little time of peace. God will allow all kinds of trouble to make you reasonable to share the gospel. Because when we're comfortable, we tend not to do it very well. So if you like your stuff, use your stuff to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just a thought. Okay, That little time of peace, that would be the loud cry. What follows it? Once more, the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me, and again, everything was the utmost confusion. Strife, war, and bloodshed with famine and pestilence raged everywhere. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion, and then men's hearts failed them for fear. Now take a look at Daniel 11. You have a war that wakes people up based on prophecy. You have the loud cry, a short time of peace, the share of the final message. Michael stands up, and you have the time of trouble like there never was, including the Battle of Armageddon, which is both spiritual and physical. Um, yeah, I know it's spiritual, and some people say, and you say physical as well? Yeah, in the book Great Controversy, it talks about people tearing their leaders apart with their bare hands. That's kind of physical. <sighs> uh, but look at the mercifulness of God here. He has a Bible prophecy to get the world's attention. Got their attention, gives them the loud cry. Only then does he close the judgment. He's going to do everything he can before the judgment closes, wake people up. He's out to save your kids, my kids, and everybody else's kids. Daniel 11 tells me God cares about his people. Uh... Here's an interesting one. This might be a bit complicated. This is the first time I'm going to try it on an audience. Ellen White says this, In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with him that forsake the Holy Covenant. And she quotes 31 to 36. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. And in Daniel 11, verses 44 and 45, the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate God's people. So there is a repeat of the earlier persecutions that happened during the Reformation. So that's all she's saying, but she's saying in verse 30, we're talking about the papacy. Now, implications. It's the same power in 29, so it has to be the papacy there. He returns, so it has to be the power before that has to be the papacy in 25 to 28. And a repeat would be in 44 and following, so the king of the north has to be the papacy all the way through from the time of Christ onward. Just like it's the little horn in Daniel 7. Okay, it, it matches the parallels perfectly. But that's important because other groups want to bounce this all over the place. So if we take a look at 29 and 30, it says, at the appointed time, he... Well, let me skip down to 30. Ah, uh, She says this power in 30. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So if this he right here is the papacy, this has to be the same one. All right? But... He's returning against the South. 
So that has to be the same self all the way through too. If that's true, what about, um, yeah, if that's true, you have to have a consistent southern king of the south. Islam matches. What about the French Revolution and radical left? It fits in here well, but it doesn't fit here or here at all. Which means the king of the north has an ally, the United States, and the king of the south has an ally, the power from the French Revolution. And they worked, it, the Islam and the radical left worked together, and the papacy and the U.S. worked together in the final conflict. And you try and find anything in today's world that shows that those powers aren't doing that. It's everywhere. And so you have the day of worship is caught in the middle all over. I want to share this one too, Ellen White. The God who gave Daniel instruction regarding the closing scenes of this earth's history will certainly confirm the testimony of his servants as at the appointed time they give the loud cry. All the messages given from 1840 to 44 are to be made forceful now. For there are many people who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. Again, it's based on Daniel, right? The message is given and there should be no delay in repeating the message for the signs of the times are fulfilling. Let me back up. I just went too far. I failed to point out. You have to have a, she's saying they have a repeat of 1840 to 44. Right? Now, the message was given and there should be no delay in repeating the message for the signs of the times are fulfilling. John 11:29 when it happens you believe. All of a sudden right at the end when it's happening this Daniel's being fulfilled that last part you're suddenly going to get action all over the place. The closing work must be done a great work will be done in a short time a short time of peace a message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry then Daniel will stand in his lot. That's a reference to 11-12 vision again. To give his testimony. Now what does she mean by 1840-44? to 44? If you know history, you should know. But I'm not going to go the history to prove it. Ellen White actually explains it. At the very time specified, Turkey, which was Islamic, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of the Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. She's referencing Josiah Litch, who said the Ottoman Empire would fall on August 11, 1840. Events on August 11 in e Lebanon, Egypt, and Turkey all led to them becoming a protectorate of the European empires. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates. And a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and in publishing his views, and from 1840 to 44, the work rapidly extended. Oh, 1840 is when the Ottoman Empire collapses. So here's what we have. We have a fall of Islam that leads to a prophetic Miller movement, the Millerite movement, that proclaims the judgment and the coming of Jesus, but Jesus doesn't come. There's going to be a repeat. Oh, let's say Revelation 10 says there's going to be a repeat as well. So does Daniel, the context of Daniel 8 through 12. I'm not going to get into that, but the very context of Daniel says you have a repeat. Uh, so we have a fall of Islam, a prophetic movement, the loud cry that proclaims the close of the judgment, and Jesus does come. Daniel 11 would be this prophecy. Now get this. Revelation 10 says there's time no longer. This one was all based on time. Revelation 9, Daniel 8. This one, based on Daniel 11, has no time prophecy. It is a sequence prophecy. And you don't know what the time element is. It's a repeat with no time. 
man, all of it fits. And that got me excited. In volume 9, page 19, Ellen White says, in a special sense, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been given a message to share a prophetic message with the world. How well are we doing? Kind of sad that it's going so slow. She said on page 20, are we to wait until everything is fulfilled? She said, God forbid, have faith. Uh, after it happens, oh yeah, that's what I believed. She says, in visions of the night, fireballs coming down, engulfing mansions. People said, we didn't know. Adventists said, we knew, we just didn't know it'd be so soon. And those other people said, if you knew, why didn't you tell us? I don't ever want to hear it. That's why I tell everybody I can. I think it's time to take Jesus and the Bible seriously. Ellen White said, the third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry and you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty and still entertain the idea that at some future time you will be the recipient of great blessing when without any effort on your part a wonderful revival will take place. Today you are to give yourself to God that you may be emptied of self, emptied of envy, jealousy, evil surmising, strife, everything that should be dishon that shall be dishonoring to God. Today, sounds like Revelation, I mean Romans, Today is the day of salvation. We need to be serious. Study Daniel 11 and 12. It's been ignored for far too long. Do you realize there is only one prophecy that explains the time of the end in Daniel? It's Daniel 11 and 12. It says that's what it's for. And if we're living in the time of the end, which one should we be paying attention to? Do you know we turned our young people off because we keep talking about the 1840s and they don't care. You don't care about the 1840s either. That was present truth at the beginning of the Advent movement. But we're not at the beginning of it anymore. It's still true. But we're not at the beginning. Daniel 11, 12 has the close of the judgment and the events leading to the close of the judgment. Tell me, which is more appropriate for our world today? Close of the judgment. So why aren't we talking about the one that talks about the close of the judgment when Michael stands up and what leads into it? It's what I just shared with you tonight. Uh, share with others, books, tracks, video, anything you can. Uh, public seminars. Hey, you can get our DVD set and go have a home group if you want. Praise the Lord, go do it. Uh, if you want the handouts to go with it, go to our website. There's no copyright on them. Download them, print them, and use them. <laughs> and make sure you're praying. And uh, I'm going to take a couple of minutes for questions. And then we'll have a closing prayer. And if you want to ask any more questions, you can. My goal is an hour and a half, and that's what I got it into. <laughs> Question. Ten day. Which part is 17? Yeah, uh, I do bring that in uh, because the prostitute has a cup in her, uh, and 18 has a cup, right? And so wherever we mention it, uh, it, we bring that out as a papacy. We don't go in depth into that, but we do tie it together. Ah, yes, because they're streaming this. So the question was Revelation 17 in the harlot. And so I don't get in depth in it because it's a Daniel 11 seminar, yeah. but I could go a lot deeper than I do. Uh, and if you want to know my take on the kings, they are the nations of prophecy. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the papacy, France. Because it's at the point in the context at the point when it is not. The United States is coming up when the papacy is going down. So you have France in Revelation 11 and what follows, the radical left. You have the United States. The end time players are now there and the papacy comes back. That's my simple viewpoint. It's all the players of prophecy of Daniel and Revelation. They're just there. 
And the Ten Horns are the European powers throwing their support behind the papacy again. So there's Dan Revelation 17 very quick. <sighs> Anybody else with a question? Yep, got one in the back. Yeah, you made it. <laughs> Well, let him ask his question. He's got a question. Oh, well, I know this guy. Uh, yeah, well, he's, he still has a question, okay? <laughs> uh, in regards to uh, Daniel eleven forty, where it says that the king of the south shall push at the king of the north and mm -hmm. he shall come back against him like a whirlwind, <clears throat> we often have referred to that as the inflection of the deadly wound. Yet we see these powers. Some have. We see these powers that you're talking about since that 1798, still pushing. How do you how do you explain that? The Hebrew there, and again, I'm not a Hebrew expert, but this was a whole section of our discussion up at Daniel 11 conference. The Hebrew is can be translated either at or during the time of the end. It is not a sometimes. That phrase, that type of Hebrew in the Bible is at, sometimes it's during, and there is no way to know other than context. And so some people, you weren't here, I don't, in here when I was showing the pictures of the old woman and young woman? Okay, some look at it one way, some look at it the other way. And I'm saying, I'm not going to argue with either because they're allies. Some, some Adventists see it as a deadly wound. I see it as the king of the south in the time of the end is pushing. And that pushing has come from both the powers of the French Revolution and Islam. But Islam is the primary king of the south all the way through, and its allies are the French Revolution and those who follow it. Is it possible then that uh, this push could still be happening on the part of the king of the south Oh, and then, and it then definitely is. We're, and then, then, they're not down yet. But then could it also be true that the deadly flu, flu uh, the deadly wound has not been inflicted yet? Oh, I think it has been. The deadly wound has been inflicted. Uh, there is going to be a deadlier wound coming for the papacy just before the coming of Jesus when everybody turns on them. Okay. <laughs> uh, because he he goes down comes back and goes to perdition. <laughs> that last one he didn't come back from. <laughs> so yeah, he's going to get another worse deadly wound. This one's going to finish him. Uh, any other question? Otherwise, we'll just have a word of prayer and close. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I am very grateful for the opportunity of sharing your word. And Lord, I ask that your spirit would lead each one of these people to study. And if they find it to be true, that they will share it with people all around them. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Oh, one other thing. Tomorrow night, I'm at Mesa Palms. Uh, then on April 8th, Camelback Church on Friday night, Sabbath morning, and 11 o'clock as well. I'm expanding it into a three-part presentation there. And uh, then on Sabbath evening, Cave Creek SDA Church, and 6.30 Sunday, Prescott SDA Church. If you think somebody needs to hear it, send them one of those places. And tomorrow morning, I get to talk to Academy students. That's my favorite group. To, no, it's my second favorite group to talk to. My favorite group is probably a group of Seventh-day Adventist pastors. You ought to see their faces when I start. It is like, you're not going to teach me anything. <laughs> and uh, it's so much fun to watch those guys start engaging. Let me say this about Adventist pastors. I have been told by church administrators that Seventh-day Adventist pastors no longer care about Bible prophecy. It is not true. They don't care about our traditional viewpoint. That part could be true. But every time I've done a minister, been in a ministerial meeting, 
and I'm then allowed to have a seminar, the room has been overflowing with pastors who aren't interested. Put it this way, they put me in a room in North Pacific Union, and I told them that room's not big enough. They said, oh yeah, it is. You won't get that big a crowd. I said, just remember I warned you. <laughs> the room filled. The walls around the back of the room were full. The aisleway was full. The floor around me was full. I was jammed into the corner. I couldn't move. And the hallway outside was full until they couldn't hear down the hall. These are the Adventist pastors who don't care. Right. But they, like our young people, if we're just going to keep rehashing Daniel 2 and 7 and stuff, they don't care about that. That was present truth for the beginning of the movement. Daniel 11, 12 is the one the prophecy says it's for the time of the end. Let's move to the next one. And, and young people will respond much, much better to this one. Three separate presentations. We're, we're, uh, we'll cover the basics, uh, of, and we're going to look a lot more in depth. At, well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to take a look at Daniel 11 up through verse 4, 39, Friday night, the basics. Then we're going to look at the time of the end at 9.30 during Sabbath school, and at 11 o'clock we're going to go into the left-right and I'm going to unpack Dan Revelation 11 and Daniel 11 in far greater depth. And for each one of those little headers on that one, there are news stories that explain it. I mean, there, I, yeah, I know I covered a lot of things and I gave a summary. If you wouldn't want to challenge any one of them, we can go a lot deeper. We have the backup. But our time's over. <laughs> okay, God bless you guys. If you want any of our materials, they're out there in the lobby.